and why do it tonight? Strengthening ties. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visits Saudi Arabia and meets Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Dark skies. Polluted air from wildfires engulf most of central Canada and spreads to the northeastern United States. Revised outlook. The World Bank revises our global growth outlook for 2023. What's the reason for this revision? Festivities return. Hong Kong's colorful bun festivals return in full swing after pandemic hiatus. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and this is World News. We start off tonight's broadcast with two strong nations trying to strengthen diplomatic ties. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Saudi Arabia and later met Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman amid restrained relations between Riyadh and Washington. It's only his second trip to the kingdom. And the arrival of America's top diplomat, Antony Blinken, is the latest step towards trying to mend a strained but strategic relationship between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. The two nations have not seen eye to eye in years on a plethora of issues, leaving many points of contention up for discussion. Just days ago, Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter, pledged to further cut its oil production by one million barrels per day to boost flagging crude prices, in a move that could surge costs for American consumers at the pump, as well as worsening global inflation. Riyadh has, in a deal brokered by Beijing, recently renewed diplomatic relations with Tehran, at a time where tensions have spiked between Tehran and Washington. However, the kingdom is still dependent on the U.S. for wider security assurance against potential threats from Iran's nuclear program. It's also expected talks about Ukraine will be on the table. Saudi Arabia recently hosted President Zelensky at an Arab League summit before placing sanctions on Russia's interior minister in what appears to be stronger international engagements. And both Washington and Riyadh have worked in conjunction to broker a lasting ceasefire between warring factions in Sudan. This week, Secretary Blinken brought up the possibility of a rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, saying it was in the U.S. national security interest to see the pair normalize ties, despite admitting it would no doubt take some time. New York City topped the list of the world's worst air pollution as harmful smoke wafted south from more than 100 wildfires burning in Quebec. Smoke from Canada's fires has periodically engulfed the northeast and mid-Atlantic for more than a week, raising concerns over the harms of persistently poor air quality. An unusually orange sky hung over Canada's capital of Ottawa on Tuesday as authorities warned of the health risks associated with smoke from unprecedented early summer wildfires. Ottawa's air was at the worst level on Environment Canada's Air Quality Health Index, indicating very high risk. Physicians, too, are sounding the alarm. People who are experiencing homelessness and spending a lot of time outdoors, uh, the risks to those folks will be higher. Quebec, which neighbours Ottawa, is the province most impacted due to multiple fires ignited by lightning. Evacuations have been ordered in some areas. The air over Toronto was also polluted Tuesday, and officials say conditions could persist through most of the week. Just across the border, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation issued a health advisory of its own, suggesting residents limit strenuous outdoor activity. It's all a result of an intense start to Canada's wildfire season, which officials say is on track for its worst ever year, as warm and dry conditions are forecast to persist for months. Around 7.5 million acres of land have already been burned across nearly all of Canada's 13 provinces and territories. Over in Haiti, at least three people have been killed in an earthquake with a preliminary magnitude of 4.9, struck after devastating floods took more than 50 lives. An earthquake on Tuesday has caused buildings to collapse and devastated the city of Jeremy. Another natural disaster only days after massive floods took dozens of lives. Torrential rain that fell from Friday till Sunday caused floods and landslides across Haiti. 
The floods killed at least 51 people and injured 140. The local government says 18 are still missing. The footage of people picking up clothing that has been washed away by the flood shows just how much rain poured in the area. This mother lost a child. I lost a five-year-old child. I risked losing two, but God left the other one hanging in a tree. I saved one, but I lost one anyway. Authorities say more than 30,000 houses have been flooded. The United Nations Secretary General spokesperson Stefan Dujaric told reporters on Tuesday that the Secretary General extended his condolences to the families of the victims and said the UN is ready to help Haiti. The UN stands ready to work with the Haitian authorities and other partners to help ease the suffering of those in need as it relates to the earthquake and, of course, uh, the other natural disaster, which is the flooding. But he added that the ongoing insecurity and damage to roads are hampering any relief efforts. Rescue operations are also hindered by Haiti's ongoing problem with criminal gangs that are in control of many areas. South Korea expected to expand cooperation with U.S. and Japan on North Korean issues as a non-permanent member of the UNSC. There is much anticipation over South Korea raising its voice on North Korean issues amid increased provocations by the regime. As a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for two years beginning in 2024, South Korea will be able to better address North Korea-related issues. It will now be involved directly in discussions and debates regarding statements and resolutions passed by the Security Council, which has the primary responsibility to maintain international peace and security. According to an expert speaking to South Korea's role as one of the ten non-permanent UNSC members is symbolic, as it shows the country's position as a legitimate world leader noting that South Korea's position in the global community has been growing for the last 20 years or so. And so South Korea's membership on the committee, on the council, is significant insofar as it now participates directly in voting on resolutions that are binding on all member states. He also added that South Korea will be able to express its desires to the international community, particularly on matters that the country has a great interest in such as human rights and nuclear proliferation. As a member of the Council, South Korea will also be able to strengthen trilateral cooperation with the U.S., a permanent member, and Japan, a member of the Council for the 2023-2024 to term. This is the first time since 1997 that the three countries have taken seats at the U.N. Security Council together. As North Korea has recently ramped up the development of its nuclear and missile programs, the three countries have been working together to better respond to those threats. In fact, over the weekend, South Korea, the U.S. and Japan agreed to operate a system to share North Korea missile warning data in real time, before the end of this year. However, there are still challenges in order to implement strong measures against North Korea, as the U.N. Security Council cannot make a decision if there's a veto from one of the five permanent members, which includes China and Russia, with both countries unlikely to change their position on Pyongyang. The World Bank has raised its outlook for the global economy this year but cut its 2024 outlook due to monetary tightening and the war in Ukraine. The latest global growth outlook for this year has been set at 2.1 percent. That's according to the World Bank's Global Economic Prospects Report released Tuesday, which has revised up its previous forecast of 1.7 percent from back in January. The revision comes as the U.S., China and other key economies have proven more resilient than expected. But it's well below the 2022 growth rate of 3.1 percent due to geopolitical conflicts like the situation in Ukraine, supply chain risks and monetary tightening around the world. The World Bank also cut its global growth forecast for 2024 to 2.4 percent from 2.7 percent in January, citing the ongoing effects of monetary policy, which has seen business investment reduced. It also raised concerns over the possibility of a further economic slowdown caused by stress in the banking sector. By region, the U.S. economy is expected to grow at 1.1 percent this year, while China's growth is expected to climb to 5.6 percent due to its recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns. However, the bank caught its previous 2024 forecast for both countries. 
In the eurozone, growth is forecast to slow to 0.4% in 2023 from 3.5% in 2022 due to the lagged effect of monetary policy tightening and energy price increases. The outlook for South Korea's growth was not mentioned in the report, but the bank expects East Asian economies to improve alongside China's recovery. Meanwhile, on the back of the revised outlook, U.S. stocks closed higher on Tuesday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.03 percent, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq gained 0.36 percent. The S&P 500 rose 0.24 percent to finish at its highest level since August last year. We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. A mere 300,000 people participated in demonstrations in Paris, the lowest since protests against the government's deeply unpopular pension reform started in January, while police put turnout at 31,000. Despite the low numbers, French unions remain determined in their fight against raising France's retirement age. From Marseille to Bordeaux to the northwestern town of Morlaix, for the 14th time in five months, people in France are out on the streets to say no to the government's pension reform plan. Turnout may be down, but protesters say they are as determined as ever. The main thing is, even if we don't gather as many people as we have done in the past, the people who are here today are convinced. What we also have to take into account is that we can't ask everyone to be able to go on strike every time because we're well aware of the problems of purchasing power today. It was a similar story on the streets of Paris. People in France remain overwhelmingly opposed to raising the retirement age to 64. But with the reform now enacted into law, it seems the government may have already won the battle. Opposition MPs intend to hold a vote this Thursday to get the legislation scrapped, a move that the majority says they'll prevent. In no other democratic country is a reform passed by force despite almost the entire population and all the trade unions being against it, despite unprecedented protests over the last six months. This is a serious matter and shows that we have a democratic and institutional problem in France. President Emmanuel Macron says the pension overhaul is essential to keep the system out of the red. With summer holidays fast approaching and inflation easing, the head of state will be hoping the public will move on, but critics say they'll keep up the pressure. Around 40,000 people are said to be evacuating after a dam in southern Ukraine collapsed on Tuesday. Both Ukraine and Russia are blaming each other for the dam's collapse. Thousands are being evacuated after the destruction of a dam in the Ukrainian city of Novokokovka on Tuesday. According to President Vladimir Zelensky, some 80 towns and villages are at risk of flooding, with authorities saying some 40,000 people needed to evacuate as water is surging down the Dnipro River, creating a flood risk for the Ukrainian city of Kherson. Zelensky blamed the collapse on Russia, saying it's impossible for Ukraine to have done it from the outside, as the dam is under Russian control. It is physically impossible to blow it up somehow from the outside, by shelling. It was mined. It was mined by the Russian occupiers, and they blew it up. However, Moscow denies the allegations, saying that the dam's collapse was due to nothing other than an act of sabotage by Ukraine. The Kremlin added that Kyiv conducted the act to distract attention from a failed counteroffensive against Russian forces. Speaking to reporters, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said Ukraine was also trying to deprive Russian annex Crimea of the fresh water it receives from the reservoir. Meanwhile, White House spokesperson John Kirby said Tuesday that Washington cannot say conclusively who's to blame for the dam collapse, but added that the damage to the Ukrainian people and to the region will be significant. Despite the impact the dam collapse could have, President Zelensky says the incident will not affect Ukraine's planned counteroffensive operation. Taken to Telegram on Tuesday, Zelensky stressed that the destruction of the dam would not affect Kyiv's ability to deoccupy its territories. Zelensky says Russia acted chaotically in destroying the dam, ultimately allowing their own weapons to be flooded in the process. We have some good news for you. 
A pill has been shown to halve the risk of death from a certain type of lung cancer when taken daily after surgery to remove the tumor. The results were unveiled in Chicago at the largest annual conference of cancer specialists hosted by the American Society for Clinical Oncology. Lung cancer is a form of the disease that causes the most deaths with approximately 1.8 million fatalities every year worldwide. It's been tested on patients with the most common form of lung cancer, known as non-small cell lung cancer. The trial was conducted on around 680 patients. Half were given the molecule osimertinib, the rest a placebo. After five years, 88% of patients who were given the treatment, which is marketed by AstraZeneca under the name Tegresso, were still alive compared to 78% of patients who were given a placebo. It's taken as a pill. You take it once a day. It's very simple. And as it penetrates the cells of the tumor, it's like a key in a lock. It blocks the cells from proliferating, and sometimes it causes them to die. The treatment is intended for patients whose tumors show specific mutations and have been surgically removed. It's a form of what's known as targeted therapy already widely used to treat breast cancer. Targeted therapy is breaking new ground in cancer research. Lung cancer is the deadliest cancer worldwide. Each year, it causes approximately 1.8 million deaths. Prince Harry launched a fierce attack on the Vale press, blaming tabloids for destroying his adolescence and late relationships as he gave evidence for almost five hours in his lawsuit against a tabloid publisher. Prince Harry launched a fierce attack on what he called the Vile press as he gave evidence against a tabloid publisher on Tuesday. It's the first time a senior British royal has been in the witness box since the 1890s. He blames tabloids for destroying his adolescence as he gave evidence against tabloid publisher Mirror Group Newspapers, or MGN. Harry and 100 others accused the publisher of the Daily Mirror of widespread phone hacking and unlawful information gathering between 1991 and 2011. The Prince faces hours of cross-examination from MGN's lawyer Andrew Green over 33 newspaper articles whose details he says were obtained unlawfully. Green began by personally apologising to Harry on MGN's behalf over one instance in which it admitted unlawful information gathering. In his written witness statement, Harry denounced the treatment he'd experienced at the hands of the press, saying he'd been labelled a playboy prince and a failure. He said the press would try to destroy his relationships with girlfriends, blaming them for causing his circle of friends to shrink and leading to bouts of depression and paranoia. In another section of the statement, he said, quote, how much more blood will stain their typing fingers before someone can put a stop to this madness. Asked by Green if he was suggesting by this that MGN journalists who wrote the articles at the centre of his lawsuit had blood on their hands, Harry replied, some of the editors and journalists that are responsible for causing a lot of pain, upset, and in some cases, perhaps inadvertently, death. Harry said thousands, if not millions of stories had been written about him as Green pressed him on whether he'd read the Mirror Group articles in question at the time they were published. The seven-week MGN trial began last month. About 20 members of the public queued to gain access to one of around a dozen seats available to the public inside the courtroom. MGN has previously admitted its titles were involved in phone hacking, settling more than 600 claims, but Green has said there was no evidence that Harry had ever been a victim. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care of the world in a minute. The searing heat wave in Bangladesh spurred the closure of primary schools this week and triggered frequent power cuts, worsening conditions for residents unable to run fans to cool themselves as weather officials warned relief will not be imminent. Two people and several others were injured after a shooter opened fire outside a venue of a high school graduation celebration in Richmond, Virginia. The world of golf was left stunned as the PGA Tour, DP World Tour and rival Saudi at LIV circuit who have been involved in a bitter fight that has split the sport announced a shock agreement to merge and form
form one unified commercial entity. United Nations General Assembly elected Algeria, Guyana, Sierra Leone, Slovenia and South Korea to the UN Security Council for a two-year term starting on the 1st of January 2024 by Belarus allied with Russia in its invasion of Ukraine was denied as part. For nearly two decades, Indonesian marine scientist Siafuddin Yusuf has worked with former poachers to rehabilitate coral reefs destroyed by their use of dynamite for fishing. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We end up tonight's broadcast in Hong Kong as locals race to collect traditional deserts from a tower as the annual Sheng Shuang Bun Festival returned to a full scale for the first time since 2019. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening.